Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome to the 10th session. We will conclude the topic of trusses and move on to cables. If you remember, the last class we ended by looking at a method of dealing with any truss that is statically determinate, where all we need to do is to solve is to first identify appropriate independent equations of equilibrium and to solve these equations somehow simultaneously. Now, the good old method of joints is the method we normally use for small problems. But for larger problems, for space trusses, for compound trusses, for complex trusses, that becomes a little difficult. We saw that in the last class. You can always write. So here you have a systematic way of writing the equation of equilibrium suitable for use in a computer, or even manually. So we'll look at that. If you recall, <coughs> the first thing to do is to identify the joints in the truss, in the, in the pin-jointed space frame and to choose your origin and your Cartesian coordinate system and identify and uh, write down the coordinates for every joint. So here you have a joint A and you may have so many members connected to that joint. You have to identify the, the, the node from this joint to the next joint, maybe B. You have to get the coordinates of that and uh, say this is a f first member, second member, third, fourth, etc. And you also have to know at that joint what is the external load acting. This is all given to you. And that load will have components in the XYZ direction. You have to write down clearly uh, those components. And when you take a free body, it doesn't matter whether you are having an external load or a support reaction. You, in a free body, you don't care. It's a force. It's something external to the joint. The bar force is something internal. We use a symbol Ni to refer to the bar force. And all that you need to know is the direction of that bar force. The direction of the bar force is given by the inclination of that bar for the coordinate system that you've chosen. So it's given by the direction cosines. We looked at this LMI. L, M, N, and you know L squared plus M squared plus N squared must be normalized to 1. And you just write down the equation of equilibrium in the X direction, Y direction, and Z direction in terms of not the bar force, but bar force per unit length. That's because the direction cosines always have L in them. So you shift the L to N and define something called a tension coefficient, Ti, assuming the bar force is tensile, if it's positive. If it comes negative, you know it's compressive. So Ti equal to Ni by Li. So that's why this is called the tension coefficient method. This is actually a tension coefficient. And if there are 10 bars, you have 10 tension coefficients. You can systematically write these equations and solve them. Let's demonstrate this method with a plane truss, which is a compound truss, and also we'll do it with the space truss. First, let's take this truss. This is a compound plane truss. It is simply supported. It has just one load. It is symmetric. So you can, for this particular loading, you can reduce the number of unknowns. Let's take all the unknowns on this half, and so the forces here are symmetrically disposed. This force will be equal to this force and so on. 
And the reactions are also easy to get because uh, there's only one load, 100 kilonewton. So very obviously 50 here, 50 there, 50 kilonewton, and this must be zero, sigma fx. So reactions you've got. Now this is normally difficult to solve manually. We'll show you a clever method. In the olden days, uh, you had to do it manually. And so the challenge was, you can always use a method like the tension coefficient method. You'll always get it right. You start with any joint, write all the equations, but you'll end up with so many equations which are coupled. So you might make a miss, uh, error in solving. You know the problem, you know, your, uh, if you do it by Gauss elimination or matrix formulation, your size of your matrix is large and it's coupled. It's not a good system. So people have talked of clever ways of solving it, which we'll also look at for the sheer fun of it. Okay, the same problem we'll do manually with a simpler method. But right now, let's use the blind method, the rigorous method of how to do it. First thing you need to do is choose an origin and write down the coordinates for all these joints. So we'll do that. Let's choose the origin at the left extreme end. So A is 0, 0. B is 9 meters above A, so it'll be 0, 9. C is, uh, is in the x direction, 5 meters away from the origin. In the y direction, you have to work out. You can get the actual value. And then so on. And like that, you can write down for all these joints, A to F, the coordinates. Anybody can do this. In fact, it all depends on your choice of origin. You can change the origin. Now you just apply the equation. You have only two sets of equations. Sigma Fz doesn't apply here because this is a plane truss in the xy plane. So if you take a joint A, the external load at this joint is Rax, which is obviously zero in this case, plus sigma Ti into Xi minus Xa. That's all you have to do. Uh, here there are three bars, so you'll have I equal to three. Similarly, in the y direction. In the y direction, Fay would be plus 50 kilonewton. So let's show you a very simple way of writing the equations uh, where you can't go wrong. So take this joint A. First, you mark which are the members connected to this joint. You can write them 1, 2, 3. Oh, sorry, 1, 2, and 8. 8 is equal to 3. N8 is equal to N3. All tension assumed. So at joint 8, this member 1 is connected to B, member 2 is connected to F, and member 3 is connected to D. Right? And you have all the coordinates here. So this is what you do. Sigma Fx equals 0, sigma Fy equals 0. You've got three bars, T1, T2, T3 are the three tension coefficients, and these are the external loads. In the x direction, the external load is 0 kilonewton. In the y direction, it's plus 50 because your y axis is pointing up. Okay? Right. Now, you start by writing down the coordinates for A. X, A, Y, A. Just write them there. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. These are the coordinates of A. This is the X coordinate. This is the Y coordinate. Easy. Then you take the first element, T1, which points to B. So you have to write XB minus XA, right? And YB minus YA. So just pick up 0, 9 and copy them there. 0, 9. Then you look at the element 2. Element 2 goes from A to F. So what do you do? Look at F. And just whatever you've got here, put them there. 5 comes there and 0 0.64347 comes there. Then you look at the third element. Third element connects to D. 10, 9. Just copy 10 and 9. Okay? You've got two equations. In fact, you simplify them. The first one is such that some gets, this gets eliminated. And for here you can easily get T2 is equal to minus 2 T3. Manually you can get this. Similarly, you can simplify this. I'm not doing that. Likewise, you move from one joint to another joint. If you go to joint B, 
You can do the same exercise. Here the members are 1, 3 and 4. And please note the, the coordinates of B are 0, 9. So that comes here minus 0, 9, 0, 9, 0, 9. And you can simplify. If already you've solved for, uh, for these, you can plug them in. So you get two more simultaneous equations. Similarly, you go to joint C. You get two more. That's it. With this, you can solve manually if you like. And you can get uh, you've got six equations, you've got six unknowns, you've got all the answers. Okay, try to get them as accurately as possible. Four significant figures is very good. And don't forget to write the units, they are tension coefficient. These are not actual forces. They are forces per unit length. You have to multiply by the length. You can do it systematically by writing the bars. One, which is the same as six. Two, seven, three, eight, four, nine, five. Write down the solutions you got, kilonewton per meter. Calculate the lengths. Well, the length of this is this minus this xd minus xa, the whole squared, plus yd minus ya, the whole squared, and the square root of that. Very simple calculation, so you can do that. And uh, then whatever you get here in meters, you multiply the tension coefficient and you get the final solution. This is how the tension coefficient method is done. Clear? I just wanted to demonstrate you may or may not do it. I'm more interested in the clever solution. Aren't you interested in that? And uh, people have worked on this. In the olden days, they used to write papers on this kind of thing. Today, those papers won't be published because everybody uses a computer to do it. How do you do it? So this is given in Timoshenko's book. Uh, someone called Henneberg. He found out a clever way of solving this. The problem with this, com this uh, compound or complex truss is that at any joint, whichever joint you go, you've got three bars meeting. So you have three unknowns and you have only two equations. So you can't crack it at any joint. So logic says somehow you must get a joint with only two unknowns. How do you create a joint with two unknowns? Yes? No, 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 no unit force. That's how the, the brilliance of analysis comes. So he said, I'll temporarily shift one joint, one member. So this is what he said. Okay, first of all, the reactions you got, then in stage one, you cut this member. Cut it with a mental pair of scissors. Then what happens to the force in that member once you cut it? Zero. Zero. Got released. Will this structure be unstable? Yes, it will because you need a member. So replace it with another member at some other convenient location. So he said, I cut it and I bring a new bar. Imagine the amount of ingenuity in thinking. New bar. All right? And I apply the load to this system and then I make up for the uh, intervention I did. What should I do? I have to bring one stage two analysis. What should I do in stage two? I had no business cutting this bar. How do I make up for the error I did? I apply. I apply a force here. Now the force is zero. I apply some unknown force, say X, in tension, which is actually N, what is this bar number? N5. This 6 is a new bar. So that's what you do here. You apply deliberately a tension N5 in this bar. Right? So what are you, this is the, this is the beauty. The force, the net force in this bar will be the force from this analysis and the force from this analysis. So I'll get 0 plus N5. Now how do I get? And so I can analyze this moving from joint to joint. And I can analyze this moving from joint to joint. I'll get solutions here in kilonewton. I'll get solutions here in terms of N5. How do I solve for N5? 
Huh? Force bar BD, then that and that. Some should be. Summation of BD. Not BD, that's N6. Yeah, that's so you say, look, there was no bar here. So the bar force in this plus the bar force in this should add up to zero. zero. That's a one equation. That's a clever move. That's how it was done. So let's look at this. This is pretty easy to do. Start with this joint. If you start with this joint, Obviously, the bar force here must be is zero because it's been cut. If this is zero, what happens with these two bar forces? They also they also become zero. <laughs> so, how easy your analysis is? Okay, now we will start here. Um, these two are equal, so you can take the n two and sine seven degrees twenty minutes is the vertical component. Two times that must be adding up to hundred. You solve in one GFE, you will get N2. Bar force 2, you get this. It's compression. Okay. Then you can go and you can start here. You've got two unknowns. You can crack them. Okay. So you can move like that. Then you can come here. You've got this is zero. So you've got only two unknowns. You can get these two. That's how you do it. So this analysis is over very fast. No tension coefficient method. Only sharp brain. Look at this now. Okay, here you have, you can start anywhere. You can start here or here, doesn't matter. Let's start here. N5, you know this angle is 30 degrees. So this angle must be uh, 60 degrees. Right? So, what do you say? These two must be equal and opposite. Their vertical component must be equal to N5. So you can write in terms of N5. This it, it's a triangle of forces, so it's N5, N5, N5. That's the only way it will work. You know that. Meeting at 120 degrees each. So this was effortless. If this is N5, this must be N5, this must be N5 in the opposite direction. This is tension, this will be compression, so minus. Got it? Like that, you can go to the next one. Uh, <coughs> which one is this? You can do it here. And... Instead of 100 kilo newton, you have N5 now acting and you can find out the solution. And uh, similarly, you can move on to other joints. I won't spend time. You can solve this. Then what do you do? What about bar 4, 6? That also you need. Bar 4, 6. You can analyze and get this also. Okay. Now the equation, the governing equation is this plus this must be equal to 0. Solve it, get N5. That's what you do. Okay, so apply this equation, get N5, plug in the values of N5 here, and add up everything, and you can solve. What a clever solution. <laughs> Good fun, hmm? especially for BTEC students to, to work on. You can solve many problems which are statically determined using such clever solutions as well. Okay, we'll come back to a last demonstration of, uh, of a problem in space truss. Okay, this is a space truss. You have to first visualize it properly. This is a plan view. The figure below shows a plan view of a space truss with the triangle ABC. So this is plan on the ground lying on the horizontal xy plane. So though this looks like vertical, it's actually horizontal. You have to put this on the ground. This is elevated, this is on the ground. Triangle DEF is 10 meter above ABC. So when you look from top, they look like this. And these are inclined members connecting the small triangle on top to the big triangle at the bottom. But you have to correctly understand the boundary conditions. Okay. You are told that restraints against translation are provided along the x, y and z directions at A. At A, it can't move in any direction. At B, it, it is restrained only in the vertical, in, in the z direction, in the vertical direction. At C. See, at, at B, 
Okay, that means it can move in the x and y directions. And at C, it can move in in uh, the x direction, but it's restrained in the y and z direction. That's enough for you to get the minimum constraints, and you can check m plus r should be equal to 3j. How do you analyze this? And the load applied is just one load p. So you can write your reactions. Actually, it will be nice to draw a 3D figure. And try drawing a 3D figure. But before that, let's write down the coordinates. This you have to do. Problem is given here. Again, we'll choose this as the origin. Now you have to write x, y, z. So it's 0, 0, 0. Then you go to b. b is x is 0, y is 9, because 4 plus 3 plus 2 is 9. Right? And Z is 0 because on the ground. Then you do C. X will be 12 meter away from A. Y will be 0. And it's on the ground so Z is 0. You got these three. Then you just have to look at the top triangle. All these joints D, E, F will have Z equal to 10 meters. Then you have to just push them X is 2 meters. So D and E will have X equal to 2 f will have x equal to 6. Then d and f will have y equal to 2 and e will have y equal to 3 plus 2, 5. That's all. Anybody can do this. In your mind you also understand what's going on. Then try drawing a 3D picture as best as you can. This triangle is at the ground and this is above. The important thing to note is not all that well drawn because this should have been slightly to the right, but it doesn't matter. And in this angle, it will look like that. A, B and D, E are in the Y axis, right? That's the, the point to note. A, B and these are in the Y axis, okay? And the load is applied in the negative Y axis direction. P is there. These are the possible reactions you can get. At B, you have only a vertical reaction, remember? At C, you can have a vertical reaction and a reaction horizontal. P is horizontal, in the horizontal plane. At A, you can have all three reactions. Got it? And you can check for stability. You have 12 bars. You have six joints. You have six unknown reactions. And M plus R is equal to 18 is 3J. Right? Now, these are the constraints given. Now, it's you can solve for the reactions in any way you want, but this problem is not very difficult. We can crack the reactions directly. Can you tell me which reactions are zero? These are the six unknown reactions. Let's get the reaction. Which reactions are zero? There's no horizontal load acting. So clearly Rax must be zero. You can just apply sigma fx equal zero. You have one more zero force. Which one? Which one is zero? you can go back to this picture and see. In the z direction, you have force here, force here, force here. Is any one of them zero? Z direction. But will this P affect the z direction force? No. Right? So, you can feel that RCZ will be always zero because this P won't have a force and then this is out of this plane. These two are in the same plane. And then you can apply your equations and solve. This P will be equated by horizontal forces P by 2, P by 2. And then you take moment equilibrium. You can find that you'll get a vertical reaction. You'll get a couple 10 P by 9 acting up there. And obviously sigma Fy must be equal. So this must be. 10p by 9 acting down. I think one of them should have a minus sign. Uh, this one has a minus sign. 
So it's actually down. This you will have to do. After you've done this, you can blindly apply the tension coefficient method. You've got the reactions. Go to this joint A and you can write the far end joints here to help you. And write down so your coordinates. So at joint A, you can write the same way we did. You have three bars. You have actually four bars. One, two, three, four. Bar one, bar two, bar eight, bar 11. And these are the remote coordinates. Got it? And these are the forces. If you divide N11 by the length of the 11th bar, you get T11. Got it? First thing you do is take A and 0, 0, 0. You can just copy 0, 0, 0. This is X, this is Y, this is Z for all the bars. They all meet at A. Then you take the first bar. 0, 9, 0. 0, 9, 0. Take the next bar. This is number 11. 2, 2, 10. 2, 2, 10. Take this bar. 6, 2, 10. 6, 2, 10. And take this bar. 12, 0, 0. Easy. Then you have to write the external load. The external loads here at this joint, you have only these two. Rax. Rax is 0. And then you have y and z we've already solved for these two okay p by 2 and 10 by 9 that's all you have to do likewise go from joint to joint and solve now this we already wrote you can simplify this and then from here itself you can simplify i'm not yet getting into that like that you can get all the tension coefficients many of them are easy to get some are zero which you can intuitively get get the length Easy to get. Length is connecting bar difference squared. You can write the length and then just multiply the length with the tension coefficient. You've got forces and that's how you solve this problem. Got it? Okay, we will conclude trusses with always going back to principle of virtual work and saying writing equations of static equilibrium is not the only way to solve. There's an alternative way rarely used because most people are, are not comfortable with it. You can use the principle of virtual work. Since you want to find some unknown force, now we'll do an internal force, not a support reaction. You have to invoke the dummy displacement method or the principle of virtual displacement. Let's say you want to find the actual force in the bar AB. Now, if you remember, we already did this and found VB by the principle of virtual displacement. Let's say you've already done this, so you know VB, you can do it. We'll do another exercise where you don't calculate VB, you can directly get the bar force. Both methods we'll do. So what should we do? This is the real force field. We have to create an imaginary displacement field where bar AB the force in bar AB must appear. That means it must do some work, virtual work. How to make it do work? It has to elongate. Okay, elongate it. So, you understand. You don't want these two bars to elongate. <laughs> so, you have to do it cleverly. Now, this bar does not change in length. This bar also should not change in length. So you take this as center and draw an arc. And this alone should change in length. And this change, this angle is, rotation is exaggerated. So that the change in length along this direction is delta, dummy displacement. So this bar is 3 meters plus delta. And this bar is whatever it is, the length, no change. That's all you have to do. Then you see what forces do work. This HA and VA, you don't even know what the values are. Not, no need to worry because they don't move. So these reactions don't do any work, virtual work. This fellow, you already found VB is 40, so it does work. You have to find out how much it moved. And then internally, this doesn't do work. This doesn't do work because there's no change in length. Only this has changed in length. And so this unknown force NAB into delta. Delta is a change. Got it? Now our job is, what about these loads? 
these loads also don't move because you never moved joint C, right? So you, you have to do a little trigonometry and crack. Look at this triangle and see how much those movements are. So this internal angle is alpha and I think it follows a 3, 4, 5 rule. This is 1.5, this is 2. So you can scale it 3, 4, 5. So the triangle is 3, 4, 5. And if this is alpha, you can show that this is also alpha using the alternate angles logic. If this is alpha, then you can work out that this 3, 4, 5 triangle, this is 3 delta by 4 because this angle is, and if this is 3 delta by 4, this angle will be 3 delta by 4 divided by this length, right? Now, because delta is very small. VB, look at the equation, very simple. The only work done is by VB. VB, which is 40 kilo Newton, you've already solved it, into 3 delta by 4 is the external virtual work. This is not doing work, this is not doing work. The internal virtual work is done by only this bar. This bar force is NAB and it is elongated by delta. Delta gets eliminated here, NAB is 30 kilo. It requires a little imagination, but it, if you do it by method of joints, you will get the same. We will just, just for fun, we will say this, you did some work to get this. Let's say I don't take advantage of that alternative method. What should I do? What is the displacement field I should take if I don't know VB? What is the displacement? If you want to look at the original, this is a problem. I don't take advantage of this. I don't know VB. I don't know VA. I don't know HA. I don't want to calculate any of them, which means a and B should be where they are. This joint can move. <laughs> and AB must increase in length. How the hell do you do that? <laughs> VB is still not doing work. So horizontally it can increase in length. This is the easiest thing you can do. You just kind of mentally heat this bar and let it move here. In fact, in a just rigid system, if you heat one bar, the other bars will just adjust themselves. There will be no force. Yes or no? That's what you do. So just imagine this bar elongated by delta due to some thermal movement. Then this will move here. How do you get this movement? Take this as center, take, draw an arc. That's all. And it should be in such a way that this length must be the same as this length and this length must be the same as that length. So I want you to think over it. This is just for fun, but this also can be done. And I won't spend too much time on this. You can work out uh, what this should be. If this is delta, you can prove that this rotation is 3 delta 4 by 4, 3 and then you can work out the vertical displacements and the horizontal displacement. You just need to know how much is this and how much is that. Alright? When we were BTEC students, we did lots of these exercises using what's called Williet Moore diagrams. But today people don't. But I just want you to know that there is a powerful method. You must be good in trigonometry. That's all. So you got this delta, you got these moments, now you just invoke, invoke the principle of virtual work. What do you do? The, the, the external work is done by, remember there was a 40 kilonewton load acting vertically? That into 3 delta by 8 is a vertical movement here. There was a 30 kilonewton load acting horizontally here. That into delta by 2 is a movement there is a total external virtual work because none of these support reactions do any work. There is an internal work done, the same internal work, NAB into delta. Solve this, you will get the same answer. Don't break your head too much over it, but it's good for students to develop 
their intuitive and analytical thinking by cracking such problems. So with this, we say goodbye to trusses. Any questions? We are looking only at statically determinate trusses. We look at indeterminate problems later. Can you guess what will happen in an indeterminate truss? I'll give an example. So, since we are not doing that, I want you to guess. Supposing I have a truss like this, subject to some loading, with a diagonal. And uh, I could have kept the diagonal like this, or I could have kept the diagonal like this. I know how to analyze if there's only one diagonal, yes or no? I am an expert in statically determinate structures, I can crack this. Supposing I give both the diagonals, it becomes statically indeterminate. How do I get the answer? Before we move on to cables, I want an intuitive answer from you. If there is only this black diagonal, whatever with the loading, I know how to get the, the, the reactions don't depend on the diagonals by the way. So I'll get some reactions, I'll get a horizontal reaction here and I'll get, uh, I, I don't know, maybe this is, so I, I might get something like this. Okay, these I get, whether there's one diagonal or two diagonals, reactions I've got. Then I can use method of joints and crack. If it's the black diagonal, I'll start here and do. If it's the green diagonal, I'll start here and do, I'll get all the bar force. So, uh, maybe you can label the bar 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. You've got only... So, how do you solve for these five bar forces? It's internally indeterminate. So can you just give me a guess? Good engineers make good guesses. You'll say, I, this information, I need more information. What information do you need to solve this problem? It is statically indeterminate. You have to have to solve a compatibility condition. So what information do you need? You need? Dimension, of course, we'll give you. <laughs> A, B, C, D coordinate you can get. That's not, you. You're, what do you need to solve an indeterminate? Huh? Basically, you need the actual stiffnesses or flexibilities. E, A by L you need. Say that. What do you say? You need cross-sectional area and you need the modulus of velocity. Correct. And then you need to work a little bit. Now, uh, let's say somebody has already solved this problem and he's saying, sir, can you check and tell me if it's okay. So you've got the solution for one diagonal, that is easy to get. You've got two solutions, the black one and the green one. What do you think will be the solution when both diagonals are there? Rough solution. It will be an average. Common sense. Never lose your common sense. It has to be an average. That's how practicing engineers do it like that. The actual error from the average will be very small. Many problems are like that. You can always guess by solving. Okay. You have no more questions. We'll move to the interesting topic of cables. Now, just like we said, and cables uh, will cover many topics quickly. Cables. What is a cable? 
what is the cable? What is the beam? We looked at. What is the truss? We looked at. What is the cable? What is the difference between a cable and a truss element which can uh, tie? Difference between a cable and a tie element is? Cable is very flexible like a string. First thing is a truss member, a tie member is, is not what do we mean by flexible? What we mean by flexible is its flexural rigidity is zero. A truss member can still bend a little bit. A string cannot bend. Right? Cable is, its stiffness is practically zero. But you can have large diameter cable which will have some stiffness. Okay. But relatively flexible. That's one distinguishing feature. Next, cable cannot take compression. Again, if it's a very stiff cable, maybe it can take compression. A string cannot take compression. Cannot take compression. Two important points. These are the idealizations we use for uh, when we look at cables. Okay. So then we'll also look at arch. What is the difference between an arch and a, and a cable? What, what is common to both cable and arch? You, you are, you think like an architect. You are always left brain oriented. Looks wise. Huh? Mirror image. <laughs> no. How do you draw an arch? Draw something like that. Curved thing is an arch, right? Engineers spoil it by saying even you can have linear arch. Okay, take care. Something like that. Right? Cable will be like this. Upside down. What is the difference between a cable and an arch? Let's say taking gravity loads. Hmm? Arch resists loads through actual compression. Cable resists loads through actual tension. Simple. Right? But there is a big difference. What is the big difference? Arch. The internal force in the arch is rarely pure compression. Internal force in a cable is always pure tension. The internal force in an arch is actually a plane frame member. That means it, it is subject also to some shear force and some bending moment. Except in some rare cases. What are those rare cases where an arch is just like a cable, only thing? Instead of tension, you have compression. What are those rare cases? They are called funicular uh, structures. So, both cables are always funicular. What is the meaning of funicular? Funicle comes from string. Yeah, you said something? It takes the shape of I thought there is no bending moment in the cable. So, it, it, because it takes the shape of bending moment diagram. Diagram of what? So internal bending moment. Internal bending moment. All bending moments are internal. Okay. So, say it correctly. It takes the shape of what? First thing you should say is, the cable is like our mind. It always changes shape. Right? Arch is stiff. Once you cast it in concrete, you can't change the shape. First, so always right brain. You see the problem, you jumped into bending moment. 
First you see your arch is rigid, cable is flexible. First thing that. Now you said something about bending over. I'm, I didn't understand that. Do, did you understand? Do you, can, you, can anyone explain? Uh, so you're right, but uh, I have a, if yeah. I have a cable and I try to put a load, so it will bend like this. If I have one load in the middle. So similarly, if I try to... When you say bend, again, as an engineer, be careful with the word. Bending means change in curvature. There's no curvature. Okay, it will take a shape yes. which resembles a bending moment diagram. Yes. Of? 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 Uh, that you have to complete the sentence, no? If uh, the thread is, like the cable is straight and I take it as... Of an equivalent simply supported beam with the same span subject to the same load at the same location. Unless you say the whole thing, I will say what bending moment, the bending moment diagram in a cable is zero. Okay, very good point. Now, that means the cable, because it can resist loads only by actual tension and there is no question of resisting through with the help of actual force, uh, actual force and bending moment, shear force and bending moment. And it can take only tension. These are its uh, constraints. It has to change its shape depending on the load applied. It will keep changing its shape depending on the load applied. Told you clothesline. You hang, put a hanger with a shirt, something hanging on it. It will take this triangle. You remove it, put a sari, drape it, it will take a parabola kind of shape. Keeps changing shape. Same cable. Can't do that with an arch. So an arch is funicular. Will have pure compression only for a particular type of load. And ideally you have to find out which is the most predominant load and make the shape match that. So you will have incidental loads, you must be able to handle that. Cable you don't have to worry. It will keep changing its shape. It's clever because it can resist only tension. So that's a beautiful way of understanding. Here are some pictures of uh, cables in structures. The first is your clothesline, but we'll make it a bigger structure. For example, you've all traveled on a cable car, no? You can see cities traveling. What's happening? One car slides from one end to the other end, right? And the cable is also a little heavy, so it's self-weight itself is distributed load. So when you have a distribute if you hang a shirt and a sari together, you'll still have a curved shape. Okay, so that's what you are getting here. So this this is a, a moving load. This is now very popular. You have all membrane structures. Hmm? They are pulled with cables. Or you can have a cantilever with cables connected to the free end. Right? And these are pre-tensioned so that Whatever weight is there, self-weight, it can handle. And any additional live load also it can handle. So these are like truss members, but they are always pre-tensioned. So that even if some compression comes, the net result will be tension. Like in your spokes of your bicycle wheel. This is a suspension bridge. We saw some pictures of suspension bridges where... The main load, this is your deck. Traffic is going to move on this deck. It could be a pedestrian bridge, it could be a highway bridge. And you have closely spaced vertical elements called hangers, suspenders, their intention. They pass on the load from the deck to this cable so it's a cable with a lot of almost distributed loads acting on it. And the cable is anchored. There's, we look at how to design these uh, things on top, pulleys and so on. They're anchored. So, And 
because we don't want the shape of the bridge to change as you move, the, uh, it has to be a little stiff. So this girder is typically made stiff. It's called a stiffening girder. And so the shape of this is kept more or less the same all, all the time. And if you treat these loads as uniformly distributed, then by her argument, the shape will be that of a, what is the bending moment diagram in a simply supported beam subject to uniformly distributed load? It will be parabolic. So you can make it parabolic. That's how suspension bridges are made. And to make it statically determinant, they put a hinge there. Nowadays, we don't put hinge because we know how to handle statically indeterminant structures. A cable stayed bridge. It doesn't have a profile like this. You have a pylon, you have a deck, and you uh, you have straight cables inclined. There are many types, fan-shaped and so on, harp-shaped and so on. So the cable is pre-tensioned and so you have to know which, this is going, if you pull it, then this is going to be subject to actual compression in some region, in some region it could be actual tension. So this is another, but the longest bridges are always suspension bridges, not cable state bridges. Okay, you've probably seen it. Anyway, we're looking at the application of cable. Here the entire structure is a cable. Here cable is one component of a system. Here also. Okay. Of course, the main component here is a cable. Two assumptions we make. One is perfectly flexible, which means it cannot take any bending moment or shear force. It also means it can't take any actual compression, only actual tension. Second assumption we make is it is inextensible, which means the change in length is negligible. Why? Why is this assumption needed? Otherwise, the problem becomes nonlinear. problem becomes non-linear because then you'll have to look at that also can be handled hmm? and you can have large movements in cables so we'll begin with uh, since we started with trusses let's work with trusses this is a familiar truss with for you this uh, pin jointed frame and let's say I apply load P here if I apply load P here and its location is at the ratio 1 is to 4 in the span. This reaction will be 4p by 5. This will be p by 5. And then how do I get these reactions? Well, I apply the moment of the equation of condition mb is 0. So I take this free body. If this is 4p by 15, this must be 4. So if mb is 0, then you'll have only actual forces here and you can work out the, the forces in N1 and N2. This is called first order structural analysis. The bending moment at B is zero. Agreed? We can easily solve. This is a simple truss, okay, where both these bars are subjected to actual compression. You can calculate these values, okay? What happens if I weld this joint? and make it rigid. Those of you who attended my class, keep quiet. The rest of you tell me. I make it rigid. Which means it is capable of developing moment resistance. Okay, and by the way, this is an arch, not a cable. So it's subject to compression. So it can take bending moment and shear force. So what do you think will happen? Will this solution still be valid or something will change something new will come intuitively you will say something new will come right because mb is no longer guaranteed to be zero right then how do you remember people ask this question how do you still approximate a rigid joint as a pin joint in a truss and here's that question how do you do that Huh? So, will you get a moment MB? Yes or no? Yes. All right. 
Next question to you, is that moment sagging or hogging? You have this element and this element. So MB in AB and MB in BC must be equal and opposite. Will it be sagging or hogging? What's your guess? Huh? How many people say sagging? Okay, you have to guess, boy or girl, sagging or hogging? Since your right brain is practically dead, you can't make out boy or girl. Otherwise, you should tell quickly. What's your hunch? Sagging or hogging? I hope you know the meaning of that. Yeah. We finish beams first. How many people say sagging? A half mast only, raise it. Okay. Hogging. Only, only, okay, equal. Others? Don't know. Don't know is a safe answer. Okay, let's see what's going on. This is a classic case where unless you bring in the use of right brain, you won't understand, you won't enjoy it. Let's do it. Okay, so we know, by the way, the vertical reactions are not going to change. But the horizontal reaction may change because I'm not going to invoke mb equals zero. Only if I invoke mb equals zero, I get the horizontal reaction that 4p by 15. If MB is non-zero, it can change. So, let's take the sagging, let's take the side of the sagging party. If MB is sagging, this, there must be some MB here, MB there equal and opposite. Yes or no? And I've drawn the free bodies, this X I don't know. Agreed? Now, use the right brain. What does that mean? Draw the deflected shape. Draw the deflected shape. Maintaining compatibility. So if you try to draw it. Okay, let's go back. If I make this sag. Oh sorry, this sag, it will go like that. But then this angle has to be 90 degrees. I mean, whatever angle, I don't know if it's 90 degrees, it looks worse. Whatever angle there is, A, B, C must be maintained. And if you want to maintain the angle, this must hog. Because there is no load in between. So it's very strange. If I have sagging here, I will have hogging there. Which means they will never be opposite. Forget equal. If they are adding up, then MB will be non-zero moment which will not work unless you apply an external moment there which is not being applied. Let's do the reverse. Let's make this hogging and let's because I'm getting this shape. But then I'm, I need a sagging there. So this also doesn't work. So this is not possible. The member is confused. Should I sag or should I hog? Because my partner must do the opposite and equilibrium won't be satisfied. So left brain, right brain. So what's your final conclusion? It will just be as it is. Got it? It will just be as it is. MB will remain zero. And the answer you should have told me, that's because this shape is funicular. Because if you took a boulder here and put this load there or a beam there, the bending moment diagram it has a triangular shape. And so, because the geometry matches with the free bending moment diagram, you got a funicular shape by accident. You, should, you didn't have, you didn't recognize it, but so MB must be zero. And so, that's how you, even though this is a rigid joint, it will behave like a pin joint. At least in first order structural analysis. In second order structural analysis, this argument may not work, you will still have a little secondary moment. Why? Can anyone give a reason? Here, we assume these to be actually rigid, so that B did not go down. Supposing B goes down quite a lot, then you can still draw both sagging. It's possible. So, but that is unlikely if you have reasonable actual stiffness in these two members. It's very difficult to draw it. The frame has a funicular con con configuration, no bending moments or shear forces. So let's look at 
funicular polygon. You heard this word? Once upon a time, in engineering mechanics, somewhere you must have heard. Funicle, you understand. Funicle means, in fact, in many places, the cable car system is called a funicle. Okay. So, let's take a body and subject it to some arbitrary forces, P1, P2, P3. Then, let's put them sequentially in a polygon like this. P1, P2, P3 to some scale. Okay, these magnitudes are scaled. The directions are known. P1, P2, P3, you do like this. And then if you take the starting point and join to the ending point, that is your resultant force. You know that. That's how you get the resultant force. This is called the force polygon. Which means, okay, now I can play games. Let me imagine some point somewhere away. You can put it on this side or this side, it's left to you. And we call it a pole and connect it with A, B, C and D. And I imagine that there are additional forces here, F1 and F2. And now I understand that P1 is the resultant of F1 and F2. Likewise, P2 is the resultant of F2 and F3. Likewise, P3 becomes the resultant of F3 and F4. Now, I take out these fellows and string them all together with the same direction, F1, F2, F3, F4, and I apply P1, P2, and so I've got my funicle. I put a string here, okay? Put a string there, and I apply these loads, and the system works beautifully, right? So I can conceive of, I can spread out from the basic P1, P2, P3, I can create, conceive of infinite strings. Some of them are shaped like this, that means they are all in tension, or I can flip them over and, and get them in compression, in compression. So the resultant will be this R, which is the force acting. So that's how these forces are connected. It doesn't matter what structure there is. But if you have a nice system like this, then you call it a funicle. Okay, so this is called a funicular polygon. And then you can give some fixed supports here, uh, pin jointed supports here so it doesn't move and then you have a system in equilibrium. Alright, if you put, okay, if you draw this again, this is a loaded funicle, a cable or string. So then this F1 and F2 can be viewed as N1, N2, N3, N4. You have three members, 1, 2, 3, 4, you can get the forces. Okay, by simple equilibrium, which you can get from geometry. This is a loaded funicle. If you put the pole on this side and play the same game, it gets flipped over and you get a funicular arch. We never say funicular cable because a cable is always funicular, but an arch can be funicular only for one set of loads. You change the loads, it becomes non-funicular. Okay, so this is another possibility. So let's prove what she said. That this has something to do with the bending moment diagram. You must complete the sentence of an equivalent simply supported beam. All right. So look at this structure. This is called an ideal arch. And you don't need to assume that there's a hinge there because the shape is funicular. So the bending moment here will always, not only the bending moment here is going to be zero, the bending moment is going to be zero everywhere. <laughs> In between also at A and C definitely, everywhere is going to be zero. Then only it's funicular. All right, how do we prove this? And it's true whether you have an arch or a cable, the same logic holds good. The reactions are upwards, here the horizontal reactions act inwards, here the horizontal reactions act outward. That's the only difference. In fact, we use certain words. We use the word horizontal component of tension is 4p by 15 throughout this arch. Horizontal co component uh, of compression is 4p by 15. The 
word used is it's called horizontal thrust. The horizontal thrust in the arch is 4p by 15. The horizontal component of tension in the cable everywhere is 4p by 15. The nickname for that is horizontal tension. Horizontal thrust, horizontal tension. That's the one constant throughout provided you have only vertical loads acting. Then what is changing? What is changing? Even the vertical component is constant for this portion and it's constant for this portion. The vertical component is nothing but your shear force in your equivalent beam. So the vertical component of the thrust here, vertical component of the actual tension here will always be 4p by 5 for this segment and for this segment it will be p by 5, p by 5. Got it? That's all that you have understood now. Actual compression in this system, actual, this is called an ideal arch, sometimes called a linear arch for this loading. This you don't call ideal cable because all cables are assumed to be totally flexible and capable of resisting only tension. Now let's take the same load and instead of a arch or a cable, let's just put some boulder, any shape, any stone. You might say this looks like a beam. Yes. Looks like a beam. Don't say beam should always be prismatic and all. Actual boulders look like this. Who cares what the shape is? Reactions are still going to be the same. 4P by 5, P by 5 if it's applied here. Right? Here, there is going to be no horizontal reaction. Why? Simply supported. Rollers should be here. Here, horizontal reaction is there. What does the horizontal reaction do here to this? The horizontal reaction is the key for the funicular system to work. How does it work? No. It's, it's not going to move much. No. What is the job of the horizontal reaction? Make the... Yeah. You should put it correctly. What is the moments you have in this beam? You will have a... Uh, let me change the shape. Let me draw a frame. I can draw <coughs> some arbitrary arch. Not this arch. I draw, draw another arch. I can draw any shape I want. But it's simply supported. So in all of them, the reactions are 4p by 5, p by 5. And in all these simply supported systems, one thing is constant, the bending moment diagram at any section cut normal to the horizontal axis will have a bending moment shape like this. Yes or no? Whether you like it or not. And we'll give a notation m not x, m0 x. This is called the free bending moment diagram. Free from horizontal restraint. If I remove the horizontal restraint, you will get this. Of course, this will collapse, but this won't. Got it? This will not collapse if it's a rigid arch. Cable will not be able to handle it. All right. So, something must be, this horizontal reaction must be doing something to eliminate M0. Where? At B? No. <laughs> Everywhere. Then only the system will work. So, this is a sagging moment. So, the horizontal reaction is bringing some hogging moment which will cancel the sagging moment everywhere, at every section. That's a magic. That's, a, that's what you are trying to say. Can we prove it? Yes. Let's take this case of an arch, H. Let's take some location X where the ordinate is Y. The bending moment at x is m not x. And if it has to be funicular, the net moment there should be 0. So what's the answer? h into y. So the net moment will be sagging moment m not x minus h into y. Right? y is a function of x. This must be 0 if the system is funicular. That's a rule. And so, if this is 0, you can write y of x equal to m naught 
divided by x divided by capital H. H is a constant throughout. I told you H is called the horizontal thrust in an arch. H is called the horizontal tension in a cable. H is a constant. M0 of x is given for a particular loading. The free bending moment diagram is statically determined. It is known. So y of x, y of x is directly proportional to m0 of x. y of x is that. That is the argument we are going to use. The shape of the cable or the funicular arch must match the bending moment diagram to some proportion at every location. So, if I apply a loading like this, the ideal arch will be like that and the cable will be like that whether I like it or not. The only choice I have is in the length of the cable. So I can make the cable like this or I can make the cable like this or I can make the cable like this. What's the difference between these three cables or three arches? The value of the reaction will change. If I have a shallow arch or a shallow cable, I will get a huge reaction because this is not changing. If this is shallow, this will be huge. If this is large, this will be less. That's all. So we will stop uh, with this brief introduction to cables. It's very exciting. But you see how logically we moved. We st started with beams. And there also we will try to bring in the right brain and ask you to visualize the shape. Then we went to trusses. Now we are mature people. We can handle cables and funicular arches. Then we'll do non-funicular arches. Is it clear? So that's the answer to your question that it has to match. Why? The horizontal thrust or the horizontal tension introduces a hogging moment which neutralizes the sagging moment at every section. It has to. That's why the shape has to change. To meet this requirement. Okay. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow.